Well, tonight we're going to do things a little different. We're going to have a different format. And uh, here's what I want you to do. I need you to prime your pump, although I think you're already primed. Um, and some of you are already gushing. But uh, we started in Wednesday night talking about hearing the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God. And so tonight I want to field some questions about hearing and knowing the voice of God. And this is an, uh, an area that burns in my heart. And I, I really know that it becomes a, a point of confusion for many people. Um, it becomes a point of, well, does God speak to me today? How does he speak? How do I know if it's God or if it's not God? When you're trying to make a decision and you, you, think, you, you, you think you feel peace in your heart, but what am I looking for? And so over these next couple of minutes as we're preparing for this, I want you to start thinking and coming up with, if you have a question that's been bugging you or something you've been thinking about or something maybe you're confused about, about hearing the voice of God, then we want to try to field some of those questions. And I sure don't have all the answers, but um, I might be able to confuse you a little bit more. <laughs> or I may be able to help bring you some understanding. Amen. And so we'll just trust the Lord will give us uh, counsel and, and he'll give us um, the right things to say at the right time. And he's pretty good at his job. Can you say amen? amen. Um, but before we get into this, and I wanted to take a minute and, and let you um, kind of prepare and think about some things. And I, I asked Trevor to come up and give a testimony that I, I asked him, I said, come and give me a testimony about a time you heard God's voice and it was God. And then another time you thought you heard God's voice, but it wasn't God. It turned out. It wasn't God's voice, but you just thought it was. So I'm going to have him come and share that testimony. While, again, while we're warming you up here, if you, if you can think of a question, then we'll field that here in a minute. So come on up, uh, brother, Trevor, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. All righty. Well, let's just get right into it. Um, the first... Uh, one he wanted me to talk about was a time in my life where I heard God's voice. And uh, it was a time when I was uh, part of another ministry, burnt to a crisp, just because ministry will do that, um, ready to move on, and I left that ministry, and uh, burnt, but really seeking God in prayer, what do you want uh, for my life in this next season? And he spoke to me through two different people. Uh, and also, just in my heart, I felt a peace go to the rock. And I was like, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, nope, I'm burnt. I am not going there. So anyway, that was it. And I closed him up. And you know what I mean? He's, not, he's a gentleman. He's not going to you know, force his hand um, at first. So anyway, I uh, kept doing what I was doing. I'd go to different churches, and I would minister um, mostly out of just my gift and talent more than anything, just because I had walls up. I mean, God told me to do something and I didn't do it. So received ministry here and there for some people. And, uh, again, into my prayer closet, God was like, you need to go to the rock. And, uh, I'm like, are you sure about that? Are you just really sure? And he's like, yes. And I was like, I just can't do it. I can't do it. So this was over a six month period of time where I could, I felt peace about what he said to me, but I just was not ready to make that sacrifice again because ministry is a sacrifice and I was very selfish. And uh, finally, um, I was like in my prayer closet, I'm like, God, if you really want me to go there, you're going to have to do something other than just tell me because I just can't do it. So literally that day, I get a call from Jeremy Robertson um, and he's like, hey, let's... Uh, meet at Panera. And I'm like, okay. So Jeremy and I've known each other for a long time and uh, kind of are accountable to one another. And he kind of asked me what I was doing and I told him what I was doing. And uh, his little bottom lip started quivering. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this is going to be a rebuke. <laughs> and uh, his bottom lip started quivering and God really spoke through him to me. And he 
flat out rebuked me. And just like, you know where you're supposed to be, and you're not there. And uh, told me some stuff, some specific stuff that God had showed him. And, and um, so finally, I'm like, okay, fine. God's not, not, not messing around. He told me to go here, so I'm going to go here. And um, so I came here, and uh, because of me being obedient, I was able to find my wife, um, you know, and if you ask my sister, <laughs> my sister always jokes, she's like, you know, Jesus is going to have to come down on a rainbow with a woman in his arms and says, this is your wife, <laughs> because I was so on the other end of, you know, not making the wrong commitment. So that time of my life was a time that I really learned from because God told me something, and I knew it was him, but it was something I didn't want to hear. And so I made the choice, no, I'm not doing it. And I find that when God tells me something, he'll speak through my personality because he makes it really personal. But a lot of times it's stuff that doesn't make my personality feel good. So he'll say stuff sometimes that are sarcastic and funny because that's kind of how I am. And so he makes it personal. But if he's always telling you something that makes your personality feel good, I would question if that's God or not. Because if he's going to tell you something, God is like a father. He wants you, or he is a father. He wants you to grow. So anytime that, you know, you can just kind of coast along and, and it makes your personality feel good, you're not going to grow. You're not going to get any better. So I find that times in my life when God really speaks to me strong, it's usually something I don't want to hear. It involves some kind of sacrifice. Um, it gets me out of my comfort zone. I have to do something different. So a time where I thought I heard God's voice and it wasn't, was um, last year, I, uh, I work in the oil and gas business, uh, and I've uh, been doing it for a while, and uh, God's given me a lot of favor, not through really anything I've done, just kind of right place, right time moments where I've just met different people, and God's given me favor with them, and so I was working for a certain company, and uh, they offered me a job, and I'm a contractor, so there's a lot of you can get laid off, you can, you know what I mean? It's not a sure thing for work all the time. No benefits, you have to cover all that stuff yourself. Well, with this job, I was um, gonna get benefits, full time, the security of not having to worry about, you know, your income or whether you're gonna get laid off because you're actually part of the gas company. So I prayed and I prayed and I'm like, I really felt God was saying, take the job, take the job. And I was getting excited, I'm like, yes, take the job. and I. Saw some cancel, and, um, and a couple of people were like, well, yeah, that sounds really good. And so I was getting ready to take the job, and I was for sure. I'm like, this is God. It's close. I was driving two and a half hours, three times a week. This was going to be 20 minutes away. I'm like, this is all going to work out. And uh, literally, the week I was going to take the job, someone here said, hey, I have a word for you. I'm like, okay. And basically, it's like, you're about to do something that you think's God, but it's not. I'm like, okay, ouch. And uh, they're like, uh, it just, it isn't what it looked like. It's gonna, it doesn't look like what it, uh, what it seems to be, what it appears to be. And I don't know what it is. I don't know, you know, but it's just, you need to really need to get on your face and figure this out. And so I'm like, man, that's just weird. So um, I ended up having faith and uh, faith to hear God something different, which is hard to do if you feel like you've already heard him. So I went in, in my prayer closet, really praying, and uh, God was like, are you, uh, are you thinking that the security of this job is my voice when I've called you to have faith and I'm going to take care of you? And I'm like, ouch. So I didn't take the job, uh, and literally two weeks after I didn't take the job, uh, I got a promotion, a raise. Um, and found out some other stuff about the company, about their near future plans where I wouldn't have had a job. So, um, you know, my thought is really when you play the God card, you better be sure you know what you're talking about. And uh, you better make sure you didn't have pizza, you know, pizza, bad pizza for dinner. Uh, you know what I mean? And uh, especially when it comes to relationships, I'll say this real quick, being in ministry for 10 to 12 years and being, I'm 32, so I've been in ministry the whole time I was in my 20s when people were finding mates and everything, 
And I think the number one thing that I've seen personally with friends is people pull the God card, God card on relationships all the time. God told me to marry this person. God told me to marry that person. And I'd hate to say it, but almost 80% of the people who say God told me to have walked away from God for that relationship. So God is all about timing a lot of times. And when he says stuff, like if you're just going to a new place in God and there's a new relationship, man, I would hide, highly, highly scrutinize that relationship because the devil has assignments for you just like God does. And I can't tell you how many times that I was single that there was an appetizing relationship that I had to say no to because I knew it wasn't him. So that would be my one cautionary tale. If it's a relationship, especially romantically, man, scrutinize that sucker. Scrutinize it. So it's the second most important decision you ever make after Jesus. So, Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you, Trevor. Appreciate his honesty. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something we have to really look at. Randy's going to hold the mic here, so if you have a question. Oh, you got one. Okay, good. As, as uh, we're winding this up, I want to read this scripture. Paul was addressing the people of Athens, and he made this statement. He said, he has made from one blood, this is Acts 17, 26. He has made from one blood every nation of men who dwell all on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or a stone, something shaped by the art and devising of men's hands. So, you know, we're of his nature, and he's a father, and we're his children. And he set it up so that we would grope to find him, that we might seek him. And so it is an adventure. I mean, I believe Christianity is boring to so many people because they never get out of the boat and walk on water. They never get out and, and learn to hear and to know the voice of God. And when you're trying to do that, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have bumps and you're going to fall down just like a kid trying to learn to walk. You're going to bump your head at times. You're going to stub your toe. But the thing is, one day you'll be walking, and it'll all be worth it. So who's first tonight? We've got a question about hearing and knowing the voice of God right over here. Front row, St. Vic. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, I guess it's the voice of God. Uh, uh, I have a question. Okay. And the question is, uh, do we live under the law, or is the law living in us? Do we live under the law, or is the law living in us? That's not a question about hearing the voice of God. But it's a good question. It's a good question. We're on topic here, Vic. We are the ark of God today. The law of God is written on our hearts, no longer on tables of stone, but is written on our hearts, and so we are living testimonies. Amen? And that scripture says we're born and read of all men. Amen. The law of God is written on us. Amen. I needed you to say that for somebody watching. Oh, that was for somebody out there in Cyberland. Got it? Hallelujah. Amen. You're tricky. Who else tonight? You got a question. Right back here. Yeah, I thought God told me to, it was time for me to go back to work, but I'm not real sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. How do I know? How do you know that's the voice of God? Yes. Okay. 
All right. Well, number one, you want to compare that with the word. What does the word say? It says if a man don't work, he don't eat. So God has designed us to be productive. God has designed us to go out and to subdue the earth. And the earth, you know, we have to work in the curse of the earth now. And so, you know, based upon the fact, is it God's will for a man to work? Yeah. Is it God's will for every man to work as he is able? Absolutely. So, bottom line, yes. That's, that's, that's the voice. If God's telling you to work, then work. Now, there are situations people run into like, well, I'm on disability and I'm only allowed to make so much money and, and all, you know, well, work within the means that you've been given. And, you know, I, I believe, you know, if you're on disability, believe God for healing so you can work. Uh, if you're just lazy then you're out of the will of God anyway. Or if you're just using disability as a crutch for life. Some people are truly disabled. Some people are just lazy. And so, you know, God has designed us to work. The Bible says we're to work. Every man is to work with his own hands. And so I believe that's, an in, you know, an industry from God. Absolutely. Who else? No, no, no. Ah, right over here. Miss Jillian. I've been praying for an answer for a, a life-changing question, and I'm not getting either way to go. Mm -hmm. Am I am I asking the wrong question, or why am I, why am I not getting an answer one way or the other? Okay. Um, when you're dealing with a, is it a serious life change? Okay. When you're dealing with a serious life change. The best thing I can tell you to do is don't be like the Titanic, full speed ahead, but you slow down and you don't do anything until you get confirmation. And whenever, you know, there, whenever you're having, when you're facing something that is a critical change, I'm looking for confirmations. There's a, there's a story in the Bible about uh, Gideon. And Gideon had, you know, the Lord had told him to do something, and he was scared to do it. And he said, well, if this is really you, then I'm going to lay a fleece out on the ground. Let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. So he gets up the next morning. The fleece was dry and the ground was wet. So the dew didn't settle on the fleece. He said, well, if this is really you, God, tomorrow let the fleece be wet and the ground be dry. And so he kept looking for those confirmations. You know, there was a teaching that came out in the in the 80s, or actually it was earlier than that. I heard it in the 80s, but it had been around before that. And there was, a, there was kind of a, a teaching in the Word of Faith thing that said, don't put out a fleece for God. You know, and, and one, one teacher said, if you put out a fleece, you'll get fleeced. And I have to disagree with that in the sense of, I believe the Lord will confirm His will for our lives through many witnesses if we're open to hear His voice. And when I'm not getting clear direction, I ain't doing nothing. It's too, you know, there's, there's too many things that can go wrong. You know, and we want to be where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there, who we're supposed to be with. And so I think it's, it's just, you know, if you're not getting a clear direction, then that tells me you're probably not in the timing of God. That would be my first clue. Because one thing I'll tell you, I went through a, a series of, uh, the, I was in the same position. I had, um, I, I knew what I was supposed to do to a degree, but I wasn't getting the clear direction. And man, I was stressing myself out. I mean, I was sitting there going, talk to me, you know, and I, I positioned myself to hear every way through fasting and prayer, and I was going to make him talk to me. And one day that he just rebuked me and he said, if I'm big enough to call you, I'm big enough to tell you. And man, I got a rebuke. And what it is, is I was trying to move ahead of his timing. And, and I will say this, most people in hearing the voice of God for direction in their life, if, if I say people miss it on anything, it's timing. Because we, and especially, I mean, look at this microwave generation that we're living in especially us, we literally will miss the timing of God because we think everything is right now. 
You know, we get it now. We get it now. We get it now. And sometimes, usually when the Lord puts something in my heart, it's for the future. And when I think it's for now, then what happens is I end up missing God's timing. You don't ever want to get ahead of God. You don't want to get behind God. You're to be yoked with Him. So I would just begin to say, Father, confirm this decision and confirm the timing in this decision. And that will prop and then hold steady until you know. Because it's one of the most important things you'll ever do is to be in the right, you know, I could say we want to be in the right place, the right time, with the right people. And it, 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 it's just, does that help? Yeah. Okay, cool. Who else? Or back here. Well, Pastor David, yeah, um, the one thing that kept coming to my mind is like when I'm when I'm in prayer a lot, <clears throat> it's excuse me, it's just getting my mind to stop uh, wandering, you know, because it's like you know I'm sitting there and I'm praying, and sometimes I feel like you know George W. when he's talking about defense for the country, and he goes, "Oh, look, here's, here's a kitty." And I'm uh -huh. sitting there, and I'm trying to focus on God, and I'm trying to grab a hold, and I'm trying to get a hold of the horns of altar, uh, the altar, and, and, and really pressing for issues. But it's just, you know, how do you, I mean, is there anything specifically that I can do a little bit more to get my mind so not wandering? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, i got a lot on my plate, and it's, you know, you're always thinking about, you know, this and that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I notice that, I mean, when I want to focus, I want to focus. But it seems when I want to focus the hardest... I guess, yeah, I guess maybe I just need to rebuke the enemy more over the fact. But when I want to focus the hardest and when I want the presence of God to be the strongest, it seems like just my mind, there's, you know, there's this, there's that, and it, it's just right in the middle of it. I can even be praying in tongues the next thing you know. I stop and, I, and, I, and, mm -hmm. you, know, and you think something in your head and go, you know, mm -hmm. what, what do you, you know to do to keep that, you know, to okay. keep that rhythm going instead of getting sidetracked all the time? Okay. I, I know for me, and everybody, you said the word rhythm, and that's a good word, because everybody has a rhythm in their life. Now, one thing I started learning early in my Christian walk was this. My mind is the quietest when I wake up from sleeping. Yes. Now, I've discovered that through trial and error. And I tried prayer at all different times through my day. Now, I don't like, I don't know why, but I don't like to pray at night. I always liked, you know, to pray through the day. And so I know some people say, man, midnight, man, I just get a place with God, and that's where I like to pray. Some people, you know, they're, they're like nocturnal, but I'm not. So I begin to notice that when I first wake up, I would have a clarity in my mind. And I would be able to quiet my mind. And that's the word that I would use is I would be able to still my mind to where I could begin to hear from my spirit. Because hearing the voice of God, the voice of God doesn't speak here. You can learn how to know the voice of God in one dimension. And, and man, this is, I don't know how to, it's like trying to tell someone how to ride a bicycle. You know, it's an experience. You can tell them, put your hands here, put your feet here, push on the pedals and steer with this. But you have to feel balance. You know what I mean? And in the same way, there's a, there's a voice of God that comes out of your belly. And I can literally sense when the voice is speaking into my mind from my spirit or if the voice is originating in my mind. And there's a difference. And, and I, I, I guess through, you know, time and, and, and experimenting, because I love to experiment with the Lord. You know, that's how you train. You know, it's like, you know, somebody asked, uh, I think it was Edison one time, he had failed like 25,000 times in trying to create, you know, a light bulb. And they said, well, you failed 25,000 times. And he said, no, I know 25,000 things that don't work. You know, it's just how you look at things. And so I would begin to experiment. Now, one thing I learned was morning when I first wake up, because some people wake up if you work shifts or whatever, you may sleep during the day. But when you first wake up, typically your mind is clearest. That's something I've experienced. Number two is I can pray in the spirit. I can pray in tongues. And usually after about 30 minutes of praying in tongues, 
I can literally sense the shift of moving out of my mind and into my spirit. You know, I can sense it. It's like, okay, I'm in the spirit now. And it's almost like you see in a deeper dimension. And I'll come into the spirit through praying in tongues or praying in the spirit. And, and, and I can stay there. And then when I come out of there and then I walk back out into life, it's almost like that wasn't even real. It was like I was in another dimension experiencing. You know, it's like going and seeing one of those really graphic, uh, not graphic in a bad way, but, but uh, to the senses, uh, a 3D film. You know, it's like you're, you're almost like you're in another dimension almost, you know, with, with animation. And when you're in the spirit, it's like things are clear. Things make sense. I can be praying in the spirit, and after I, and like I say, for me, it's about 30 minutes. About 30 minutes after I start praying in tongues, I can feel the shift, and all of a sudden, man, it's like inside creative things. My best creative ideas usually come out of that time, and all of a sudden, ideas start, and, and I start seeing things, and I just, it's just like, it's like my mind gets supercharged with the God factor. And when I go back out, I can be in the sanctuary praying like that. And, and uh, when I'm like that and I'm, I'm locked in, I'll stay in that creative realm. And then I'll go back out, get busy in the day. And again, it's like I'm not there now. And that's where Paul's talking about, you know, praying in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. It's like walking in another dimension, literally. And it's awesome. But, but try, try, you know, when you first wake up, Try that and see if that helps your mind. Because now, I can go out and be in a busy day application. And man, it takes forever to get my mind to shut down. And I'll tell you how I really learned this was, was uh, when I first got saved, I would always get up early to pray. And I would sit in my living room and I'd just sit there and I'd just start praying in the spirit. And I could just feel, it was just like. And it, usually it was about that 30 minute mark. There's even a deeper dimension you can go into, and this takes about three hours for me. If I, if, I can, if I can take a time and discipline myself, and I don't have time to do it very often anymore. I used to do it more than I do now. But if you can pray in the Spirit for about three hours, you get so in the Spirit, you can't hardly stop. And you, you can, for about 24 hours or until your next cycle, a day cycle, you will literally be walking in the spirit in a dimension that's just incredible. I mean, it's just like, wow. And, and you'll find yourself, it's like you get hooked up inside and you'll find yourself praying in the spirit almost, it's almost like automatic. It's like it just keeps flowing even when you're not doing it. And you can just tap and tap and tap. And that's a real fun experiment too. And, and if you've never taken an extended amount of time to pray in the Spirit. You know, this is one reason I love to get people praying in tongues. Because when you pray in English, you know, most of us run out pretty quick. I mean, try to pray in English for an hour. And unless you're pretty skilled in prayer, you'll be, you'll be going, I know I've been going 30 or 40 minutes. You look at your watch, you've been praying three minutes, you know. And you're like, holy smokes. This is going to be a long hour, you know. But when you pray in the Spirit, you can just kind of start getting caught up and lost. And it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Who else got a question? Right. Mine's a little more on the uh, uncommon side, I guess you could say. Okay. Um, kind of twofold question. One, uh, w what has been one of the most influential experiences, such as being caught up? such as an open panoramic vision that you have had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two, what would you say is um, maybe the strongest catalyst for such an event? Okay. Because I don't, I don't, I don't believe God's a respecter of persons. Right. So if you Amen. can have it, so can I. Amen. And uh, cool. what, what is that catalyst in there? I mean, maybe there's not just one, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, what's okay. been most influential for you and the catalyst? Okay, cool. All right. Well, I, I've had so many... Um, there's probably about six experiences that I couldn't really choose between one or another in as far as a 
I mean a supernatural event in my life that altered the course of my history. Um, and they're all, you know, in my book. <laughs> By my book. Anyway, um, they're all in the book. You know, most of them are in the book. But I've had some dramatic. But what happened to me, and this is what I would encourage everyone, because what you said is exactly right. God is not a respecter of persons. And what happened to me was when I was uh, first born again, I was in a, a church that was cutting edge in the, in the country, kind of like this one is here right now. And we were a spiritual church. And uh, we had a speaker in three or four times a year, Kenneth Hagin. And uh, I, I had never been around full gospel where anybody believed for anything other than die and go to heaven. You know, believe in Jesus, die and go to heaven. That was how you did it. You had a boring life on earth. So Kenneth Hagin would come to our church and he would start telling about these experiences he had. You know, and he would always, he would, he would say, you know, in 1962 at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon in McKinney, Texas, the Lord appeared to me in a vision. And the Lord said to me, son, I'm going to teach you how to discern demons. And, and he would tell us, and I went, what? Jesus is appearing to people? I never knew he could do it. So I immediately said, well, why won't he do that for me? And I began to seek and believe for it. And that's the whole key is, you know, when you ask, Jesus said it will be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, the door will be open because of persistence. I believe my persistence in this actually helped me begin to have some of the supernatural experiences that I had in life. My persistence. Because if I hadn't had the persistence, I don't think the Lord would have, you know, done what he'd done for me. But the persistence paid off. And so, you know, those experiences that I cherish as, you know, man, when the Lord made himself real to me in so many ways. When I saw hell, I saw heaven. I saw the preparation for heaven. When I, I had, you know, uh, the Lord appeared to me in, in three or four different major times in my life. You know, it was because I believe I just sought him with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. And, and one thing, I'll say this, when you seek God with all your heart, there's not that much competition out there. It isn't like the Lord is having to appear to millions and millions of people because there just aren't that many people seeking him with all their hearts. And I always thought of that. You know, I'm like, well, Lord, I'm one doing it. So... You know, I want to hear, I want to see, I want to know, I want to experience you. You know, when I saw hell, I prayed for years. And I said, now you showed me hell, I want to see heaven. But between heaven and hell was 1982 was hell. But it was 2000 and about 8 before I saw heaven. That's a long time. But I prayed that whole time, I want to see heaven. And so I got to see it. So I, I believe it's seeking and knocking and asking and just saying, God, I want to see you. I want to experience you. And I found one other thing in my life. I sense in my spirit when visitations are coming. And how I sense them is, usually I'll get this real yearning. And that yearning, I believe, is granted by the grace of God. I don't even think it's a natural thing. It's, it's like... He gives you faith to use faith for him. And so I'll get this. I'll be like at times in my life, all of a sudden it's just like, Lord, I need a visitation. I, I need a visitation. It's time. And I, it's almost like he announces his coming. And his announcement of his coming is given to me by a divine yearning that he plants in my soul. You know, the scripture says in Psalms, he gives you the desires of your hearts. I added uh, uh, an explanation that I said, God plants the desire so he can grant the desire. And I believe he'll actually, he's already planted that in you, that desire for a visitation. And so you just start crying out every day, Lord, I desire visitations from your presence. 
however you want to visit me. Lord, I want visitations from your presence. And man, it is, I'm telling you, you talk about messing you up, man. When he comes, I, I'm telling you, you think you, I'm going to ask him this, I'm going to ask him this. You'll only ask him what he allows you to ask him. Nothing else will even come. It, it's not even allowed to enter your mind when you're in his presence like that. It's awesome. Awesome stuff. Amen. Who else? Questions about hearing the voice of God. Mm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Uh, hearing the voice of God you know, a lot of people say, well, what, what does it feel like to hear the voice of God? What does it sound like to hear the voice of God? The voice of God speaks to you. You know, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so his voice, first of all, if he ever amplifies into the natural, I've only had a couple of times where there was an audible voice that spoke to me. And only a couple of times. And Kevin Leal shares, shares a great testimony about how God spoke to him audibly one day. And he thought that was so cool. And then the Lord came back and said, the only reason I spoke to you audibly is because you're too spiritually deaf to hear me any other way. So he wasn't so cool after that, you know. But hearing the voice of God, the voice of God can speak to you in your spirit. And when he speaks in your spirit, it's a strong intuition. Sometimes you hear it, and sometimes you just feel it. But it comes again. I can't say it enough. It, there's an origin to the thought, to the, to the sound, and it's down in here in your belly. The Scripture says, out of your belly flow rivers of living water. And everything in the Hebrew mindset was that the spirit of man and God's spirit would dwell in your bosom. This, this part of your being is where your spirit lives. It's actually in your heart. You know, they've proven scientifically now that the heart actually thinks and the heart actually communicates. They've proven that because they'll do heart transplants in people. And people will begin to have the thoughts of the person they got the heart from. There's something about the physical heart that even manifests in this thing. I don't understand all that, but I've just read the stories of people that did it. So the voice of God can speak to you in your spirit. He can speak to you through, again, the indirect and the direct voice. He can speak to you through prophecy. He can speak to you through a dream. He can speak to you through a vision. These things are all ways he speaks to us. There's the voice of your human spirit that many times people mess up for his voice. Now, if you notice, Trevor said something earlier when he was up here. He said what he wanted to hear wasn't the voice of God. What he didn't want to hear was the voice of God. And I've seen that over and over in my own life. You know, when I hear, when I hear a voice telling me how great I am, I discern that thing right away. Absolutely. That's not God. Why? It's just not what he does. Now, he may say, I love you, son. That's fine. I can receive that voice. But when I hear a voice tell me how great I'm going to be or the great things, I mean, so many young gifted believers will come to me and they say, God showed me I'm going to have a worldwide ministry. And I went, mm-hmm. And you can't go three weeks without manifesting right now. You're going to have a, you just put that back in the burner. That's probably a spirit of flattery working on you. That's a puffhead devil. Because like I showed you the other day with the Apostle Paul, it says he will show you how great of things you must suffer for his sake. You know, he, he's going to, instead of showing you the millions of dollars he wants to give you, he's going to show you the cross he wants you to carry. <laughs> and instead of showing you standing before the multitudes, you know, I, I, was, I, I said something here lately and I, I said, you know, there's starting to be a cliche with prophecy that I think sometimes it's overused and that's you're called to the nations you're called to the nations God see you're called to the nations and I'm like you know you're prophesying that to someone that won't even witness to their neighbors you know sometimes that just becomes a prophetic cliche instead of a real inspiration of the Lord 
You know, and you find cliches in Christianity that just get to be familiar to us and we're just speaking them without having the real inspiration of that thing happening inside of us. Amen. So you show me someone that's, that's living off the charts at home and I'll show you someone that could possibly now go to Samaria and then to maybe Judea, maybe then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. But let's get it right home first because God doesn't export failure. He, he wants to export success. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I know some missionaries, you know, they, well, I ain't going to get at that. Who else got a question tonight about, okay, right back here. Where's my mic? Oh, there he is. Okay, we'll get to you next. Uh, yeah, uh, Trevor rever referred to uh, peace mm -hmm. as an indicator. Or is there a such thing as perhaps a false p peace or oh, a deceptive type ever. thing? Yes, that's a great question, Nathan, a great question. Because that, that question right there cost me $75,000 in three and a half years of living hell because I thought I had peace. False peace. <laughs> the Bible says... Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And I like the Amplified because it says, as umpire. You know, and, and that's something that you follow peace, you follow the Prince of Peace. Follow after peace, and you follow after Jesus. But there is a counterfeit peace. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is a hard one to distinguish. One thing I, I, I guess... As far as experientially, let me tell you just a quick little story. I was, um, uh, we, we were growing at the church in Jackson, and uh, we had uh, decided we wanted to get a grand piano for our stage. Back before keyboards were as prevalent, people were still using a lot of acoustic pianos. And so we had raised money to buy a grand piano. And uh, I took the, the checkbook. And I drove to Chillicothe, and I went into the Summers and Sons Music Store. And I'll never forget, I, pull, I drove 35 miles, pulled up in the parking lot, put the car in park, turned off the key, and inside right here, I just had this sick feeling. And I'm like, ah, something ain't right. Just something ain't right. But then I began to reason. I got $6,000 right here. Um, we've already picked out the piano. We wanted a Young Chang, uh, you know, grand a baby grand piano. And we already had the model picked out and everything. And, and I'm like, I, I got so, right, I was just like, nah, something ain't right here. So I just started up the car and drove back to Jackson. And I got back to Jackson and everybody started coming up, did you order the piano, did you order the piano? And I said, no, uh, why not? Well, I don't know. I just, and, and so, well, why didn't you order it? We raised the money, you know. Why didn't you order the piano? And I'm like, well, you know, I just, I don't know why. I just couldn't. And so that night I started saying, man, Lord, I've let these people down. I was supposed to do this and I didn't do it. They raised the money. I mean, and, and now they're all looking at me like, why didn't you do what you said you was going to do? And so the next morning I got up. I drove back to Chillicothe, 35 miles. I pulled up front, and again, I turned the car off, and I felt just yuck. I felt like I wanted to vomit. Just felt yucky, right? Where at? Spirit man, right here. Something didn't feel right. But up here, everything said, full speed ahead. You got the money. You got everything you need right there. Do it. So I went in and ordered the piano. And... Uh, I gave a down payment. I don't remember what was the 500000 I think it was $1,000. We gave a down payment of $1,000. The guy said, you can just pay the balance when the piano comes. He said, the piano will be here in six weeks. They had to bring it from Korea. And so, great. So, everything's great. So, I, uh, six weeks goes by, and I call, and is the piano there? Uh, no, that's back ordered. It's going to be like seven more weeks. I'm like, Wow. Well, that night, my dad comes home. My dad printed the local newspaper. And my dad comes home, and he says, Dave, look at this. And he holds up the newspaper, and there's a, uh, an estate auction. 
and there was a Steinway grand piano that was going to be in this estate auction for the Department of Forestry. A millionaire had died and donated his whole estate to the state of Ohio Forestry Department. They were going to auction everything. Well, this was a, a, a Steinway custom grand piano that was probably valued at sixty or seventy thousand dollars maybe even more to a collector there was only a few of them made because it was custom made from walnut it was seven foot a seven foot's called a music room grand it was made in 19 like 49 or something 42 anyway so i'm like oh my gosh crap now i knew i felt sick inside I'm buying this little young Chang Korean made piano and I could have had the Steinway full size big grand piano walnut cuss. So anyway, I, I we go out to look at I grabbed Larry and we got a local piano genius and took him out there and this guy walks in and he says, Boys, if you got to mortgage your house, you got to get this piano. This is the finest piano I've ever tuned, and this guy tuned in the Cincinnati Conservatory. I mean, he was the best. He said, I've never tuned a finer piano. And I mean, it was just like I knew I'd miss God. But God is a good God. I drove back to Chillicothe. I walked in the store and I said, sir. And, and Larry, the first thing Larry told me is that, Dave, you ain't going to get your deposit back. Him and his brother, his brother owned a music store in town. And he said, you're not going to get your deposit back. They've already put the order in, blah, blah. So I go up to uh, Chillicothe. I walk in and they... Um, the guy, the, I walk up to the guy, I'll never forget, I said, did our piano come yet? And he said, no. He said, I don't understand that that piano should have been here, but it's still back ordered. And I said, really? And he goes, you want your money back? Just cancel the order. I said, yes, sir, I do. I really do. And so I got the money back. And so, you know, we, we go back home and long story short, we go to an auction it was a God, now here's, here's another one, hearing the voice of God. It was a cold morning, and I went in to get dressed to go to the auction. The phone rings. One of our ladies was a bank teller at the First National Bank. She said, Dave, I don't want to discourage you, but this local doctor who was very wealthy, he just came in and withdrew $10,000, and he said he was going out to get that piano. And I'm like, crap. We didn't have nowhere near that kind of money. In fact, we had at that time, we only had cash. We had $4,400 that I could pull together for loose cash to write that check that day. And because all the pledges hadn't come in for the 6000 I don't remember, something like that. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting dressed and I'm like, I've got to, it's cold out. I'm going to wear this long shirt and coat. And as I'm opening my drawer, the Spirit of God spoke. I, in, inside, I hear this, wear that T-shirt. That's I had a shirt, and it had a hand on the front with a nail in it, and the blood was dripping off the hand. It said, Jesus loves you so much, it hurts. And the hurts was spelled out in blood that was dripping from the nail-scarred hand, you know. And I thought, it's too cold to wear a T-shirt today. And it was like, wear the shirt. And I'm like, yes, sir. So I put the shirt on, I go to the auction. Well, if I hadn't worn the shirt, we'd have never got the piano. Because we got in a bid war, and in the bid war, it turned out this woman who, who was going after it, she wouldn't stop. So finally, we got to a certain amount, $4,400. She bid forty four. I was out of money. Guy standing beside me just pokes me and hands me a $50 bill. I said, forty four fifty, And the bidding stopped, and we got the piano. Well, after the auction... I'm walking back to pay for it. This lady comes running up to me and she grabs me. And she says, are you a church? And I'm like, this is the lady that was bidding against me. I said, excuse me? She said, are you buying that piano for a church? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you have any idea what that piano is worth? And I said, no, ma'am, but I hear it's a really fine piano. She said, do you know what that piano would bring in Columbus? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, well, I do. And I came here to buy that piano. But I looked across and I saw your shirt and I said, I can't bid against God. <laughs> Had I not worn that t-shirt, we'd have never got the pants. So there was two things about hearing the voice of God, having a, that 
you know, false peace is usually human reasoning against that yucky feeling. You know, and again, I had a, like I say, when it cost me a lot of money, was on a bad business decision where I had the false peace of I was given an opportunity to do something I always wanted to do. And I took that as the hand of God saying, go for it, even though inside right here, it just didn't feel right, guys. And I'm telling you, when you got that yucky, yucky right here, stop, drop and pray. Because there's a fire, something's going on in there. Stop, drop, and pray, man. Don't move until you get that yucky, yucky right out of your belly right here. Amen. Okay, right back. Here we had another question. <laughs> um, you say that he talked to you in dream. Uh-huh. Would he ever talk to you in the form of a nightmare, or is that the devil? Good question. Okay. Well, the Bible tells us this, that there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, would God speak to you in a nightmare? He would if I was praying that he put the fear of hell in someone then he would give them a nightmare of hell that could be terror to help bring them to salvation. But whenever there's a fear of God, the fear of God always has redemption with it. God's a redeemer. So if he scares you, he's scaring you to salvation. He's not scaring you in the sense of a torment. Um, he's not scaring you in the sense of uh, um, something evil. You know, uh, uh, a lot of dreams are, you know, a dream can either be just your soulish activity from your, your uh, life. A dream can be a demonic dream. A dream can be from the Spirit of God. I know people that have had dreams of dying and going to hell and then they got saved. So that dream would have terror in it, but it was a terror that had redemption in it. And I always look for the voice of God is always redemptive. You know, God is trying to save people, not condemn them or kill them. And so he brings hard truth that has judgment in it. But with that judgment, he makes a way of escape. You know, this is going to happen, so repent, you know. So I would say if the dream is redemptive, in other words, it's something that you can, you can obey God and, and come out of that, it's it could be from the Lord. But if it's something that has terror, it's something that is condemning, it's something that is, you know, making you feel like something evil or wrong, it's probably a demonic terror. It's probably something from the devil. And he loves to get in our dreams. I mean, the devil will visit you in the night just like God will. I've had some of my most incredible visitations, including one just this past week, of a very strong confirmation of something in my life that had to do with ministry through another dream. And so the Lord, a lot of times when I'm getting ready to uh, make decisions and stuff, and that's another one, Jillian, for you, is look for those dreams and then, you know, seek the interpretation for the dream. Because anytime I have a dream, first thing I do when I wake up is I say, you know, I just ask the question. I say, Lord, was that you? Was that you? And if it was you, what does it mean? Holy Spirit, explain that dream to me. And then there are other times I know uh, the devil just attacks you. You know, he'll just come at you and just try to vex you and torment you because he hates you. And so, you know, a lot of times uh, it is demonic. But if it's redemptive, it could be from the Lord. Does that help? Okay, cool. Who else? Mm-hmm. I've got it. Okay, go ahead. Earlier you said that he announces himself when he comes. Mm -hmm. And at the end of worship, I'm sure a lot of people felt it, but he said, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you. And he said, no, thank her. And he was talking about, I don't know what her name is. I believe it's your daughter. Nicole. Nicole. Amen. I hey. struggle with that voice every day, though. Mm -hmm. like, okay. I question whether or not. You know, I, I talk to myself back and forth. I got gotcha. you. But I don't know whether that voice is actually his or, or mine. Uh-huh. 
Okay? That's, that's, and I'm going to tell you, most of us live there. Every day, I question everything I hear, and I weigh it. Because you said it, we talk back and forth to ourselves. We talk to ourselves more than any other person. We have more internal conversations than we do external conversations throughout our lives. And especially introverts. Introvert, you know, extroverts will tend to speak more of their mind, but introverts will, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll have that internal conversation all the time. And when next time that happens, just do this little gut check. Just as much as you can, try to sense, and I don't know how else to explain it, but try to sense, is that voice coming out of your belly, up to your brain? Or is it all in your brain? And I, I don't know how that, it's, it's the hardest thing to explain because it doesn't make any sense. But again, it's like riding that bike. I, I can begin to hear things and, and I can sense it's, it's like a, it's got a source other than my intellect. Your brain, you know, speech is only formed in the right frontal cortex of your brain. But through MRIs and, and brain imaging, they have proven that when people are prophesying, speaking in tongues, singing in, in the spirit, when they're over in the spirit, they've, they've actually put them in an MRI. And you can, you know, go on the YouTube and watch that video. I think it's a CBS or NBC. NBC, I think it is. It's called... Uh, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. It's, it's a speaking in tongues video that anyway... You, you can go in there and watch it. We've got the, I've got it in my office. But they actually show that when someone is praying in the spirit or prophesying, it's the same thing. You, you're no longer forming the words here. That part of your brain goes quiet, and that's impossible. The human body can't speak without the right frontal cortex creating the speech. But when people pray in tongues, they've proven. And the, the guy doing the experiment, they asked me, they said, well, is this originating from their brain? And he said, no. And they said, where is it originating from? He said, I have no idea, but it's not coming from their brain. So it is an experimentation, but weigh it to the, vo the nature of God, the word, the principles. Is that something Jesus would say? Yeah. I would judge that as that was the Lord. He was saying, give honor to whom honor is due, you know. Her gifting opened an atmosphere for that to happen. Even asking you the question, you the question it was reaffirmed. It, it's, that's where it came from. Again. That's where it came from was right here. Amen. Amen. So go for it. And, and again, I, do, I, I, I say experiment with the voice of God, but do it safely. I never experiment with the voice of God where somebody can be harmed, including myself. I... I, I, I I practice with a safety net under me. You know, if it's something that can wound or hurt someone, then I'm not going to do it. But if it's something that, you know, this is something cool. And there were times like when I was a young pastor, I used to, to, to when I would be pre preparing for a message, I, I would, uh, you know, go get alone. And whether I was in the woods or in my bedroom or wherever, I'd get alone and I would just sit. And I'd say, okay. Show me what's going to happen tonight, Lord. Show me what's going to happen. And I was real mystical in my approach to the service. And so I'd sit in there and, I mean, I might sit there for an hour and just listen. And all of a sudden, I would get this image. There's going to be a woman with a red shirt. Her name is Helen. I'm going to heal her tonight. I'm like, all right. And so I'd get to church, man, and I'd be like, there wasn't a red shirt in the house, man. I was like, oh, crap, man. I got to go back. I'm back to the drawing board, you know. Is there a Helen here? No Helen. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, and I would experiment, but I would not do it in a way that could hurt anybody. And I began to learn through that that there were demons that would just play with me. And my own thoughts, because it can be the voice of the human spirit, the voice of a demonic spirit, or the voice of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it was just, you know... It, like in, uh, I think it's in um, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, it says, they prophesied from their own hearts. 
you know, and you can prophesy from your own heart, you know, and, and like when people are prophesying up here in the front and begin the service, it ain't like every prophecy given up here is perfect. We don't expect it to be. We prophesy in part. What we look for is if, if there's a word given that could hurt or wound someone, then that we want to check very closely, you know. Something happened in, in, in a, a very close church to us, and, and it was detrimental. I mean, it was, it was horrid, and that was a woman that had, um, like, several miscarriages, and she had gotten pregnant. And on a Sunday morning in front of hundreds of people, one of the staff said he had a prophetic word, and he called this woman up. And he said, thus saith the Lord, you know, you will carry this child to full term and this child will be born healthy. Fear not for I am with you, says the Lord. Just, and everybody's shouting and praising God. The next morning she miscarried. And the husband, he's at the pastor's office and he's madder than a Texas rattlesnake on a hot summer. I mean, this guy is foaming at the mouth. How dare this church humiliate my family you know and man it was like you talk about qu quenching the spirit and so whenever if someone would come up here and give a word like that my response immediately would be okay hold on guys now we're going to believe this is true and if this is the Lord it shall be as he said if this was just someone getting excited and stirred up in their spirit then we're not going to, we'll know this was God when it happens, you know. And there are prophecies that are subject to fulfillment, especially when there's a direct future event prophesied. You can prophesy potential in someone. You can prophesy potential in a situation. And that, that prophecy, you know, all of us have, our, our, our boundaries were set. God designed us. And set a course for us in the spirit. But we have to grope to find it. Well men, much personal prophecy is subjective. Because you can, you can mess it up. You know the Lord could have had a, had a plan for your life. But you through disobedience went the wrong way. You know. Again he's a redeemer. And if you come clean he can bring you back. But I believe personal prophecy is subjective. And subject to a person's fulfillment. You know. Uh, the, the fulfillment is subject to their obedience to the will of the Lord. You can miss God. The prophecy was dead on. You know, there are people who say, you know, I believe God's given you a calling to do this. They say, well, I ain't doing it. Whether God's called me to do it or not. Well, then was the prophecy wrong? No, the person just refused to obey God, you know. And like say, I, I went out of the will of God in an area of my life for about three and a half years in my finances and it cost me dearly, cost me dearly. But I came back to the Lord. I repented before the Lord. I told the Lord, you know, I was foolish. I, I followed something I thought was you, but it wasn't you. And I, I disregarded the peace of my own heart. And when I came clean with God, he redeemed me and restored me and gave me everything back. And so that's just the way he works. When you get your heart right, he'll make it work. We'll do one more. Yeah, right over here. From listening to everything you said tonight, like whenever they said they did the MRI and they don't see it coming from the right lobe, mm -hmm. well, maybe the voice is coming from the heart because the heart of a man is the soul. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that? that's exactly where the voice is coming from. And, and, and like I say, you can through practice and use. You know, the scripture says, them by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil using the spirit is so important so many people live and die 18 inches from God they live right here and the Lord's trying to speak out of here they live right here the Lord's trying to speak out of here I mean when you get people unlocked in their spirit and their spirit begins to flood their mind with light 
man, it is an incredible thing. It's another dimension. If you're in here and you say, you know what? There was a time I lived in my brain and I literally was not aware or keen to the voice of God coming uh, consistently to my brain. But then one day I began to make the connection and I began to hear the voice of God. And it opened a whole new dimension up. If, if you've experienced something like it, raise your hand up. So, you know, a good, a good many of you have, some of you haven't. Well, I want to encourage everyone to, to, you know, the Lord says this. Jesus told us that he was going to talk to us. He was going to manifest to us. I'm going to take him at his word. He said, if you seek me with my whole heart, my Father and I will manifest ourselves to you. The word manifest means to reveal himself without a sheet over him. I mean, it's clear and open. It's an open communion. And so I believe that. And so I always tell people, practice moving in the Spirit. Practice moving in the Spirit. It's something you can practice. Now, if you want to be a lazy Christian and just listen to all my experiences, you can do that too, and you'll... You'll die and go to heaven, and then the Lord will show you what you could have had on earth. But instead, you know, I, I, I love the old saying of a, an old friend of mine, uh, Albert Willis. He said, I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat rider. You know, you might sink when you get out a little bit. But stay safe. Don't do anything that's going to hurt people. But practice and ask questions. And if you think you're hearing something from God, but yet it, it, could, it could injure or, or hurt someone, then bring that to counsel before you follow it or give it out. Bring it to counsel. Because, man, it, it, may, be, you know, it may be something that someone say, no, 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 that's, that's probably not the voice of God. Or it might be someone saying, you know, let's, let's pursue this further. This could be the voice of God. This could be the voice of God. But the Lord wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to hear his voice. Amen. Hallelujah. That is good. Come here, Tom Sassenti. I got a word for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on up, Blair. When uh, we were in praise and worship, and you were standing there, I had a vision of you. And uh, it, was, it was really cool how it evolved. But I saw a padlock in your head. And it dropped down to your heart was like a treasure chest in this vision. And the padlock in your head had dropped down and become a padlock like on a treasure chest of your heart. And I saw an angel stand beside you with a golden key. And this angel stuck the key in the, in the padlock and turned it and the lock came open and the chest opened. And I started looking in the chest. I started saying, what's in there? What's in there? And I kept looking, and I, I couldn't make anything out specifically. I kept thinking, well, no, there's got to be something in there. And all of a sudden, I saw this golden, beautiful, like, beam of light come out of this treasure chest and flood up. And when that beam of light hit your brain, it was like... You moved into, it was almost like a spiritual euphoria. And I believe the Lord wants me to tell you that you have come into a time that your heart is going to be unlocked. And you've lived in your brain. But He wants you to now live and experience living from your heart. And I believe tonight he's here to start it, to start the process. Will you see that? Okay. Hallelujah. Come up here a little closer. I'm going to pray for you. Father, tonight I believe your angel is here. The angel of the Lord is here to unlock, to unlock this heart. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus whew, that you begin that work. Whew. Thank you, Father. Flood his mind with the light of your spirit. He's going to hear your voice. 
in a new clarity that he's never heard it before. For I will speak to you, son. Even in the ways you've questioned. Even in ways that you've questioned me about. I will speak to you. And I'm sowing inside you a discernment that you will not perceive with your natural mind, but you will perceive with my spirit. And it'll no longer be studying the body movements of people and studying their eyes and studying their gestures. But I will reveal to you the true nature of good and evil. For I don't judge by outward appearance. And I don't judge men by how they look. I judge them by the thoughts and the very intents of their heart. And I'm going to allow my strength now to manifest in your weakness. I'm going to allow my strength to manifest in your weakness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I just hear the Lord saying, training day, training day, training day. It's training day, son. It's training day. <laughs> it's training day. Whew. Oh, my, my. You're about to go on some spiritual adventures. <laughs> You're about to go on some spiritual adventures. You're about to hit God's white water. You've been on flat water, but you're about to hit the rapids, son. You're about to hit the rapids. Whew. Jesus. Whew. Whew. Mm. Whew. Hallelujah. I bear witness with you. Okay, cool. Cool, brother. Cool, brother. I wanted to ask you because you're too big for me to mess with. You know what I mean? You might whoop me if I give you a wrong word. Just kidding. Love Tom. Him and his family are a blessing. Hallelujah. Will I get my prayer team up here tonight? I hope some folks maybe caught a few nuggets out of that. encourage everyone to practice in the anointing. Your doctor practices and gets paid for it. On you, we can practice in the Spirit and stay safe. Amen? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me tonight? Tonight, before you go, if you need prayer for anything, please come and get prayer. We thank you for coming. We bless you. Tomorrow morning, we're going to begin a message that I've, I'm just calling Waking Up the Dreamer Inside of You. I'm going to talk about dream seeds and getting those things activated in your heart again. We love you. We bless you. Come and get prayer if you need prayer.